in order to show the influence of Greece and Rome, I need to show you the foundation of where they're getting all their information from. Right. So I'm, towards the end, I'm going to introduce the Greeks, and then next week, I do the Greeks and then the Romans and how the Roman Empire fell. But I need you to bear with me because I need to take you quickly through the four golden ages of ancient Kemet. So you see the foundation of where Greece and Rome come in. And as I'm going through, I'm always going to show you when I'm at a specific time, in a timeline, where are the Greeks? Where are the Romans? In fact, where are the Eurasians, period? I'm going to show you because I think our people have no clue on just who they are. We have no clue on how great we are. I had a guy come to my table this morning and he had read my book, Minchu Hotel. He said, this has changed my whole life. I had no idea we, we had this type of skills that was it that I talk about in this book. How many people here just off the cuff know anything about the Magi? All right, not even half. Three people raised their hand, okay. And if you Google Magi right now on Google, it'll have one paragraph. And it'll say the elite warriors of the kings of Egypt. And they were the ju judges and magistrates because of their uh, honest and pure heart. So now I want to ask you a question. If you got the most powerful person in the world who has at his disposal armies, military, people from all over the world, and he only wants the Magi to be the personal bodyguard and the bodyguard of the royal family, and that they are the judges of my eyes. Then who are these people? How come nobody's telling you where they're from? Where their background? Where are they getting this deep science, this deep knowledge that even the most powerful person in the world sits before their feet? So that's what's happening in my book. The spirit of the magic. I only brought five with me today. I'll bring more next week. I came by the train, so I just grabbed a, a few of the um, So I'm going to take you on this journey. Like I said, I'm going to take you <coughs> through ancient Kemet so that you begin to see what is that, the all four golden ages. And then we will introduce the Macedonians. The Macedonians conquered the Greeks. Alexander, son of Philip of Macedonia, who conquered the Greeks and annexed that empire. So most of us don't even know Macedonia, okay? But that's, that's where uh, Alexander was from. So after he conquered India, conquered Syria and Persia, then he came back to Kemet. But I want you to understand that when Alexander came to Kemet, there was no war. He didn't defeat the ancient Kemet They had a celebration. They, they welcomed him in because the tyranny of the Persians was so great that they look as the Greeks as their saviors. So I just want you to, you know, to have a clue. There was no battle, no war. Alexander didn't come in kicking butt, you know, nothing like that. He marched in at, to a welcoming party. That, you know, that it was changing, that this was going to be like a savior. It's the same thing when Islam came to Northern Africa. The tyranny of the Romans was so great that people couldn't wait for Islam because they thought it was going to be something different from the Roman terror. But what happened, we had Trinity D versus Trinity W. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to get into this. Uh, if I back up, the first thing I want to say here also is that I put, we must learn to read the Madunetje. Now I'm a, a component of this. The rabbit would not go to fox school to understand the nature of a rabbit. Do y'all understand that? I make that just as clear as possible. We are going to fox school to learn about ourselves. And if the rabbit does that, he's probably going to be rabbit stew. Hmm. And the better the stew and the more abundance of the rabbit, they might even give that rabbit a Nobel Peace Prize. The foxes will. So when we have Africans in America and Africans around the world where there's no peace, we're at the bottom of the total pole economically and spiritually right now. 
-hmm. And we get Nobel Peace Prizes, what did we get it for? The same reason the rabbit for delivery to the fox. All that he can eat. So that's where we're at right now. When we are uh, giving these peace prizes where there is no priest. I want to make it real clear. One of my teachers, El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X, when I was 14 years old, I sat before Malcolm and an organization of Afro-American uni uh, Afro unity. And uh, he stood before us. He says, three things we're going to do right away. Self-respect, self-determination, self-defense. Everybody's taking martial arts. You got no idea what stuff. Self-respect, clean yourself up. And then self-determination, you have to know your history and know your story. And you're not deep unless you can break it down so that a five-year-old can understand it. So some of us use religious words to try to make you look, your dominion to mind look like it's off the scale, but that's just mental masturbation. So what I've learned is to take the most complex situation and break it down so that the five-year-old understands the molecular structure of the universe and how it works. I had an eight-year-old in my class, and we explained consciousness. And I explained that Jehuti was your divine higher consciousness. And that you have a ego, which is in your lower, outer consciousness, that wants to control you and keep you attached to 3D material world. But when you take the veil of the ego from in front of you, the divine consciousness and the creator is waiting there inside of you. You don't need to go to church, the synagogue, the temple. Wherever you are, you are in the house of the creator. Mm -hmm. And the creator rests inside of your mind. But you got to go deeper, deeper. And so I explained this consciousness and I said, once you get a glimpse of consciousness, you realize that we are all one and that we have a job to do and we have a responsibility and that you need focus and discipline in order to do that. And no one has to teach you that once you see that. So the next week, the elder in the class came in with no homework and nothing like that. <laughs> so I'm trying to go over, and the eight-year-old said, Infidisi, just move on. Obviously, he's not conscious. <laughs> <laughs> now, his PhD father was totally embarrassed, you know, but the boy clearly understood what consciousness meant and what it meant to tap into Jehuti. He said, when he has consciousness, he'll know that we are all responsible for each other and he'll have his work. This is the eight-year-old, so, you know, I just want to give you an introduction. So the Madhu Netcha, what it does, it allows you to be able to do first-hand research. So I'm not just a regular historian, I'm a research historian. I want to research, when I look at a book, the first thing I want to see is their bibliography. Now you got a book with no bibliography, I just close that and move on. Because no one is an idol. No one taught themselves. No one is born a genius. No one is born knowing everything. It's inside of you, but you need a teacher. You need somebody to help bring it out. Okay. So when I look at your bibliography, I want to read what you read. I want to double check where you said you got your resources from. So now, if we want to learn about ancient Kemet, if we want to know the beginning of science and technology on this planet, then you need to be able to read the language of the people who wrote it. Why would the rabbit go to the fox to find out his origins? Okay, so I need to go right back there. So we need to be able to read the Madhu Netcha, because when you read the Madhu Netcha, you, you eliminate the middleman. You go directly to the source, and it's like you are talking to the ancestors personally. Because the ancestors are not someplace in the grave, they're not the spirit, you know, roaming around. The ancestors are in your blood, they're in your DNA. Through your DNA, I can trace you all the way back to the first. That means that all of them are inside of you. So when you speak to the ancestors, you are speaking to a power inside of yourself. Okay, so I need you to be real clear about that. So that's why I teach the Madhu Netcha, because I don't even want my students to say, well, Infantishi said, no, we read it in the text. And I'm going to explain in here some of the main texts that you need to go to to maybe get some of the information I'm going to talk about. There's four agreements that we have to be on. They are one, be impeccable with your word. You see, this higher knowledge is supposed to give you character, good character. If every other word come out your mouth is a low vibration word and you cuss it all over the place, then I already know something about your character. Number two, 
Don't take anything personal. You understand that you're here and you're part of the collective. So you're not trying to take anything personal. Number three, don't make assumptions. If you don't know, ask. Seek the answer. Look, research. And number four, always do your best. Some days are high, some days are low. But if you do your best, then you are satisfied at the end of each day. When somebody comes up to me, Infodisi, how you doing? Excellent. I'm doing excellent. I'm in a divine state. They start feeling better. All right? Because we are the captains of our own ship. And we have to be clear about that. Now, Africa is not upside down here. Most of us have been upside down our whole life. That's a proper spatial perspective. And what I try to show here is other African nations. See, when I talk about ancient Kemet, I'm not talking about just this one little space here on the, on the Hopi River. Kemet is the mouthpiece of the And so what you saw or what you see in ancient Kemet, the Hopi Valley here, ancient Kemet and Kaf, is a reflection of the, what was happening in the Western Desert, what was happening in Central Africa, what was happening in South Africa, what was happening in East Africa, and Kemet became the curator of all of this information. So I don't want you to think that just some magical people alone now and Scotty beamed down some information and they were the only ones that had it. No. They got their information from all parts of Africa. It just so happened if you're in a tropical rainforest and you write something down or you try to keep records of something, two or three years later, because of the humidity in the water, it's going to evaporate or be deteriorated. Great. But the ancient Kometru in the dry area wrote on stone. Okay, so they were able to preserve the information from the interior of Africa. So again, you just see just little pieces of culture of all over the African continent, and it was preserved in ancient Kenya. Now, I also need to say, well, Infodisi, was this information from all around the, the planet? Uh, no, let me just explain. When ancient Kemet was at its zenith, there was no civilization in Asia. There was no civilization in what we call Europe today, which is just Western Asia. There was no recorded civilization in North America or South America, and I'm going to show you a timeline. So I'm talking approximately 6,000 years ago. So if we go back 6,000 years ago, ancient Kemet was already full-blown. Full-blown. That means mathematics, science, astronomy, astrology. They knew the circumference of the planet. Okay, they knew the speed of light already recorded 6,000 years ago. The martial combat science of the Menchu art already at a very sophisticated stage 6,000 years ago. That's before the Japanese got to Japan, before the first emperor shut the first two dynasties in China is the Shang dynasty, which was also black, the Kushites coming, okay? It's the same people we talk about, these Magi. I just want to uh, make sure that you're clear about this. Um, North America, the mound builders haven't started building mounds yet. All right, so I just need you to just have an idea of the time period that we're talking about. The Hopi Valley, this is the same orientation. And the Hopi River, which you know is the Nile River, the longest river in the world, over 4,160 miles long, flows down north from up south. Dr. Ben told us the mountain of the moon, we come from the foothills of the mountain of the moon. What are the mountains of the moon? There's three of them. So remember when I said Kemet was the mouthpiece. You had Kilimanjaro in present-day Tanzania. In ancient times, it was called ta Neche. Neche is the word for divinity. The land of divinity. That's what our ancestors looked at, the interior of Africa. That's what they called it, ta Neche. So Kilimanjaro is in ta Neche, which is present-day also Mount Wenzori is in present-day Uganda, still part of Tanecha. Then the Hopi River is the White. The White Nile comes to Khartoum. The third mountain of the moon is Mount Choka, where they tend to rest inside of the equator, and that gives forth the Blue Nile. It meets at Khartoum, and then here, it runs all the way down to the Wedgie Wur, which today we call the Mediterranean Sea. Wedgie Wur meant the Great Green, the Great Green. Ocean. But 
now, one thing, the reason why I'm spending some time on this, I, when I said we're upside down, inside out, and backwards, I want you to be clear. The Asiatics came into Africa this way, backwards. The Nile's flowing this way, so you're going against the current. The first cataract they encountered, they said, okay, that that's, must be the first cataract. Now, if there's other ones behind that, obviously this can't be the first if it's emptying out that way. There are six cataracts. They call the 6-1 the first one. And brothers and sisters, to show you that the Western world is not, in, not trying to educate you today, go check me out, go look in your encyclopedia, go with It's got all the cataracts still backwards, even though we know we're going against the grain. But the first cataract got to be up south. So the first cataract is up here, the second, third, fourth, fifth. Only one cataract is in Kemet, the sixth cataract. What is a cataract? Just to make sure everybody understands. A cataract is a natural obstruction in the flow of energy. Uh -huh. So if you have something over your eyes, obstructing your vision, that's called a cataract. And it can remove it. A cataract in a water, in a river, is a natural obstruction. Rocks jetting up out of the ground. A waterfall. A boat cannot navigate through there. So that's a cataract. So there are six cataracts where you can't just take your boat from beginning to end. You'd have to get out, get another boat, or carry your boat across land past the waterfall, whatever, then recontinue with your journey. So there are six. And right now, all six are still backwards in all your books. I'm talking about the universities. I'm a professor at the university. Still there. So the same thing they bamboozled you with in third grade, <laughs> when you're getting your master's degree, you just get it deeper and higher mm. and more of it. Okay? Mm. They don't correct it. They just give it to you with a little bit more statistics behind it. But it's the same backwards. So I just, I'm clear about that. Now, if you notice, go to your map, check me out. Your map is upside down, and it's what it's going to say, the upside down part is going to say lower Egypt. Now, how lower Egypt is going to be up? And the bottom part is going to say upper Egypt. How upper Egypt is going to be down? Because you got to turn it around. So they know this, but we're still going to bamboozle you. All the maps up until 1400 were done by them. So I just need you to know. 1400s, the Europeans began, they were coming out of the Dark Ages as a result of being in contact with the Moors, who have conquered all, all of uh, southern Europe there, France, Spain, all of that area. They went to the universities in Barcelona and in Greece, and then they were interchanging ideas, and Europe came out of the Dark Ages when it came back in contact with African people. So let me say this. The Dark Ages of Europe is when the Roman Empire collapsed, and they had no connection with people of color. So Europe was isolated all by themselves, and because they didn't start any of this knowledge, when those teachers died out, or whatever, it was not passed, they didn't have any universities. The first universities in Europe were created by the Moors. So you just need to understand. In fact, the first several dozen. Okay. And then Oxford and Cambridge, those people who studied with the Moors, went back to Europe and opened up those first universities in Europe today. And now they make it sound like, oh, you went to Oxford. Like that's the ultimate. You, you got here from Cambridge? Oh, uh, you're Cambridge? Like that's the ultimate. Okay, so I just need you to understand where they're coming from. When the greatest universities at the time was in Timbuktu during their time. Okay, there's parallel to that. Mental slavery in place today. What happened to the highly advanced African civilization in the Hapi Ijiru Valley region? They were clearly the most advanced material culture and antiquity, thousands of years ahead of the Greece, the Greeks, and the Romans. They were 3,000 years behind us. What was the process to block out our achievements of the African population from the annals of history? But more importantly, how and under what circumstances did Africans among the very first people to invent writing, architecture, nation building, urban planning, and constructional engineering lose their arts and sciences almost completely? All of the books written about Africans by the conquerors reflect only the conqueror's viewpoint or supporting views. You have to understand, see, colonization was a genius in terms of deception. Yeah. 
I tell you, you have to speak my language in order to go to school. Now, the textbooks are written in my language, so they were printed where? In my country. So this is an economic stimulus to my country. They tell you today, France would collapse without the money they get from West African empires that they colonize. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay? So you speak my language, you get books from my... Listen, I was in Egypt this year, and we were on a little uh, uh, bus ride, and there were three Nigerians in there. And one Nigerian lady was a teacher. She was a professor. She had a master's degree. She told us that the Nigerians didn't have education to the Greeks came, I mean, to the, uh, <laughs> the British came. And she's a teacher in Nigeria. So I'm just trying to let you know how deep this is. So they impose their language. Listen, the only country in all of Africa that teaches language, that teaches math, that teaches science, that teaches literature in an African language is Tanzania. There are 54 countries in Africa. So 53 countries is using their oppressor's language to teach. Wow. Now, let me just take Ghana. Ghana, Egypt, I mean, English is the official language. Mm -hmm. Only about 20% of the Ghanaians can read fluently English. So that means they can only, and they don't learn any school in their own language. So they know how to speak tree, God. But they can't read and write it. Because mm -hmm. all school is in English. So you don't even learn your own, you don't even learn the science of the world today in your language. So you know what that does? That colonizes your mind. Mm -hmm. And you got to understand the Greeks and the Romans are the first to do this. So a modern day Europeans is just veggie backing off of the Greeks and the Romans teaching shove your language down it, make their language seem inferior, you erase their history. When the Portuguese came to Mexico, the first thing they did was burn all the books. They said the fire lasted for a month. So what they do is erase your history. So now, after your generation, you don't even know what y'all did. You now only go by what your oppressor shows you. I'm trying to show you how deep this is. Mm. And why we're in a situation like this. And then for you to glorify your oppressor's material is the ultimate insanity. That's not only crazy, that's the ultimate of insanity. I'm perpetuating the very instrument that was used to oppress and liberate and to distinguish my own people. So they don't even have to be around. If your slave master sleeps good, it means that you are totally crazy. <laughs> so even today, books, curricula, teaching materials, and educational institutions are founded on white capitalist, male, Greco-Roman, Judeo-Christian, Aryan rule models of human history. There have been minor reforms, but overall, white supremacy models systematically dominate Every intellectual and cognitive rule of education produced from metaphysics to physics to idealism to materialism to religious science and of African people are misused, misrepresented in every aspect. So brothers and sisters, as I talk to you, I don't care where you go in the world. If you go to Japan, the Japanese feel is superior, but their system is based upon European system. Go to China, they've had a culture revolution, but their system is still based upon a European model. Mm -hmm. And then every place else you go in the world, it's a European model. Yes. So we oblivion who you are, what your culture is. When I take people, people to the museum, a museum is a trophy case of white male domination. Mm -hmm. Did anybody ever tell you that? Mm -hmm. You thought your museum was a place for education, right? So the same stuff I crushed you with in first grade, now when you go to the museum, I have to reinforce that. See, you don't have no culture. Look, this is what you used to look like. Now, you look like us. This is the language you used to speak. Now you speak our language. This is the culture you used to have. Now, this is the God you used to worship. Now you got JC, you know, or you got Muhammad, or you got Buddha. Buddha was black, but that's all right. We got black crazy folks running around. Because you black don't make you sane. Okay, and don't, because you white don't make you totally evil. That's right. 
Sure, about what's going on. How do we honor and praise our great ancestors? Four ways. We speak their name. And we speak their name the way they spoke their name. Y'all understand that? So if your name was Ursa Ma'at Ra, Satepid Ra, Medi in Ma'at, you don't go Graham 67. He wouldn't even know who you were talking about. All right? You speak their names the way they, and they etched it in stone, my sister. So it's not like we don't see it. And they will make up a name in a second. We know our ancestors through Toby names. How many people here saw Roots? Everybody almost, okay? Do y'all remember? He was Kunta Kinte in Africa. When he got here, what's your name, boy? Kunta Kinte? No, your name Toby. So now we give it each other Toby names. 400 years later, we still give it each other Toby names. And then not only that, not only are we giving each other Toby names, we go back and name our ancestors, but give them Toby, Toby names. That's uh, Chihuti was the 14th or the third. No two rulers in ancient Kemet in 4,000 years had the same two names. You have a, watch this, every ruler has five names. You have a Haru name because we are Shimsu Haru, followers of the great God. Then we had a golden Haru name. That means that my legacy will live forever and won't turn us like gold. Then you have a Nepti name. I'm protectors, protector of the two ladies. So you see how we embrace the feminine energy. I embrace the two ladies because our nation is a lady. All because a nation, a, a, a nation nurtures you, takes care of you, feeds you, and helps you grow independently. So Kemet ends with a T because it's a feminine energy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we protect the feminine quality. And then number four, only two names are inside of a shin. You don't see what a shin is. Today, we call it a cartouche. Here we go again. Colleges using French. And cartouche is short for cartridge, which is a bullet. When they came to heaven and they saw the names inside of these elliptical orbits, they said, oh, that looks like a cartridge. Mm. So today, Egyptology, who are supposed to be giving, are still calling a shin a cartridge bullet. You see what happens when somebody else takes control of your information? Okay. So now only two names are in the shin. The Sa-Ra name, which is your birth name. And Sa-Ra, you would have a, the, fifth, the women would have a Sat-Ra. Sat-Ra. You are the daughter of the creator. The males would have a Sa-Ra name. That's your birth name. Because you are born divine. You are not born in sin. That's the craziest thing I've ever heard of. You, you belittle this human intelligence and the power of a human being. That's right. You were born divine. <laughs> the, the next name is called the Nasut Bitti name. And that means ruler of upper and lower kingdom. So when you put those two names together, no king no female ruler in 4,000 years had the same name. So there's no need. They got Ramses the 11th, Ramses the 12th, Ramses the 13th. They don't even know who that is. Okay? Because European concepts, starting with the Greeks and the Romans, have superimposed their culture on ours. Like they got, what, Pope John the 59th, Pope Pope 4, 108. What are they, ran out of names? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> so they took that concept and superimpose it on ancient Kemet. So I'm just trying to just give you some clarity in the film. So that's number one, you speak their name. Number two, we complete their great works. So that's what I'm doing today. I'm talking about the great works of our ancestors, right? And, and, and that's gotta be in your head because you can say, if we did it once, we can do it again. We can do it even better. And that's what they don't want young people to understand. Look what we did with basketball. The European who created basketball had no idea the game was going to happen like this. And even to 1950, they didn't let blacks in. The NBA was all white. And then the Harlem Globetrotters said, well, we're better than y'all. And they said, how are you going to beat the world champions? The Harlem Globetrotters, 1949, spanked the world champions. Right? 
they were making movies on the Globetrotters and the world champions was having problems of people attending. So the next year, 1950, they challenged them again. We're gonna challenge, we're gonna beat these Negroes. Globetrotters spanked them again for the second time. Sell out crowd. All of New York was there, the whole West Coast, East Coast. Now they say, okay, we got to accept these blacks. And so the first blacks in the NBA were blacks from actually the Harlem Globetrotters. Mm -hmm. And then we began to dominate. Today, you would think there's racism in basketball. You would think you got to be black to play this game. In the 1940s, the superstars were European Jews. That was their way out of the ghetto. Mm -hmm. The Jews were the stars of basketball. It was an inner city game. They were the stars of basketball until they let us in. Then we changed all of that. They let Oscar in and a couple of other people. And everybody who came in, we changed the game. Yep. They let Bill Russell in. He blocked so many shots. They said, okay, look, you can't, if the shot is, you can't stop it no more. They will change the game. Oh, no, you can't stand in the middle. No more three, that's three seconds. You can only be in three seconds. Oscar was hooking the ball. Oh, no, that's, that's, something's wrong with that. That's got to be a carry. You can't do that no more. Every time we came in, we changed the game. So that's what we would do in the corporate office. That's what we would do in the real estate office. That's what we would do every place we go so they have to make sure they keep us out. Number three, we complete their incomplete works. And that's what we're doing now. The incomplete works was to rise our spiritual consciousness. Not to get you hooked on a religion, but to free you so that you understand that you are natural. You are a divine being. So that's the incomplete. That's the work we got to do now. And then number four was to leave images and edifices behind, sculptures, paintings, artifacts, so that we can see what our ancestors look like. That's important, so that's what we have to do. Real quick, when I say we were upside down, inside out, and backwards, everything you think you know has to be relearned. Are you looking at the world through your own cultural eyes? A good friend of mine, He's a spiritual ancestor now, uh, Brother Amos Wilson. We used to sit down and talk, and Amos Wilson said, we see each other through European eyes. And they have colonized even what, our, what we classify as success. Think of that. If your enemy classifies what success is, then your so-called success is going to benefit them more than it benefits you. If you look at our millionaires, their money is invested not in Africa, not in African people, but in the very people who were their colonizers. So you're just giving that money right back. Think of new folks whose minds is colonized. What they say, 90% of people who hit the lottery 10 years later are broke. Not only are they broke, they're in more debt than they were before they hit the lottery. Because they never changed their thinking. They got new money, so they got five Cadillacs outside. Mercedes Benz, Rolls Royce. Picking them up, right, from the projects. Okay. <laughs> they got a house, or they'll get a house that costs $10 million. Not understanding, they got to pay taxes on that. So three years later, you can't pay the taxes on your house, and it's already depreciated 500%. So you can't even get a million dollars from your $10 million house, okay, all right? You see what happens? Because the wrong thinking. So what I'm trying to teach you is symptomatic thought. How do we change our thinking? And brothers and sisters, no matter what I do, and no matter what you hear other people say, if we don't change how we think, right. we are doomed. That's it. Mythology and superstition has to change. I, I say, if a black cat crosses through here right now, sister, what are you thinking? Yeah. It's beautiful. Good luck. You think it's good luck? Some people might think it's bad luck. Yeah. Some people don't know. No, it means the cat going somewhere. <laughs> a symptomatic thought. That's all. The cat going somewhere. He might be going home. All that other stuff. Oh man, super bad luck. Good. That's superstition. That's African people, or actually all people, but specifically us right now. That's why Africans can't do business with each other right now because of the superstition. We in Harlem used to have the ice man. He would come to the neighborhood. Y'all come get your ice, your ice. And it was a and the European Jews said, wait a minute, they making money doing this. So he started making ice and undercut the black ice man. He put the black ice man out of business because the black community had been trained by the Jews that Jewish ice was colder than black ice. Not knowing that all ice freezes at 32 degrees. 32 degrees. Okay? So you see, it's how we think, brothers and sisters. How we think. 
So, quickly, let me run through these words. We have to change how we think. No Egypt. Ancient Egypt is an oxymoron, does not exist. It's ancient Kenneth. And there's the word here, Kenneth. See, and the Europeans used to tell us that meant black land. But this is the determinative for community or city. So you're saying the black community. No pharaoh. That comes from the word per ah was introduced by the Greeks, the head of the great the White House. No. The word was Nasut Bitti. Nasut Bitti, ruler of upper and lower Kenya, as life. No cartridge, I told you that's French for a bullet. It was a shin. This is elliptical, it was a shin. No hieroglyphics, that's Greek again. The word is Madu Netcher, right here. Madu Netcher, written from right to left. No sphinx. How many people y'all see this thing and the first thing goes, oh, that's the sphinx? I mean, the sphinx don't even, it, the, 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 wouldn't even know you're talking about it. A sphinx is a mythological creature that has wings that will kill you if you don't know the riddle. Has nothing to do with Africa or that, that statue. It's Haru M. Akhetti, the Nebhu. Haru M. Akhetti, Haru of the rising and setting sun. That means it has a lion's body because lion is the king of the animal domain, but a high priest head, meaning that you control your animal nature. Don't get rid, don't get rid of your animal nature because you might need it one day, but rise to your highest spiritual nature so that you don't have to use that. Fighting is the last level and it drops you to the, the level of the animal. So if you're gonna be an animal, at least be the best animal. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Don't get it twisted. We're talking this intellectual stuff. Right now, the average teenage boy at 19 got a closet full of sneakers. The average teenage white boy got a closet full of guns. Now, if something break out, you can't run in all them sneakers. You got to grab one pair, maybe another pair, and get up out of there. Meanwhile, he's shooting it left and right. They're training to deal with you. And you are training to get whooped. Mm. And you're training to run. Mm -hmm. And how far can you run? No Nile is the hockey. No mummy. Mummy is black glue, a sack. <laughs> From the word mumia, we call it a sahu. Sahu means a spiritual wrapping and cleansing to prepare the body for eternity. And we run around talking about the mummy. No pyramid, that's Greek again. The word is mir, mir kut. No many gods, this is where they really got you. Oh man, they got all the gods in Egypt. No, it's the nature rule, principles and laws. Principles and laws. And the principles and laws work. They don't care whether you believe it or not. Gravity. Is gravity a God? Does gravity care whether you're black or white? Short, fat, tall, skinny, atheist? Does gravity care that you care? It still operates. All the principles and laws. Air don't care that you don't believe in it. <laughs> Ride don't care. They all work. But guess what? If you get up on this roof, Talking about you born again and you don't believe in gravity, you're in for a rude awakening. Mm. Wow. So, if you know how to use the principles and laws, they can benefit you on your journey. So, you see how clear that is? No gods and goddesses, that's to spook you out. So, I don't want you to believe, watch this here. If I take three elements that you know you need, if I take food, water, and air, that you know to sustain the body, you need all three. Is that correct? You can go three months without food. And the body can still sustain itself. You can go 30 days without water. How long can you go, sister, without air? Well, three minutes. Three minutes is really good. I bet you half of us can't last one minute. So now that you understand that phenomenon, which one do you know the least about? Yeah. Air. You know the least about your breath. Because that's the major one that you need to know. 
So I'm trying to show you what this educational system does. It's upside down, inside out. In you should be learning to breathe anxiety. I took a test when I was going through my initiation where they lay you inside of a sarcophagus and there's like 30 minutes worth of air, but they're going to leave you in there for 45 minutes. Wow. Now you realize if you fail this test, you don't take it over. <laughs> 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 so, what the priest showed us that they don't let you take the test unless they think you can pass it. Okay. A bear hibernates. Are you as intelligent as a bear? Once we understand what the bear does, he closes down his system, he lowers his heartbeat through his breath, through his breathing. And then he can sleep with the food he ate two months ago, digesting in his body. Hmm. Humans do the same thing. And we are more intelligent than the bear. <laughs> so if the bear can do it, you can do it. So you set your state through your breathing through a, a suspended animation. You mm -hmm. slow everything down. So instead of taking a dozen breaths per minute, you take three. 10 seconds on the inhale. Ten seconds on the exhale. You minimize that. Okay. You need to say I passed the test with fly cars. Or I wouldn't be here telling you about it. <laughs> uh, so no, no gods, principles, and laws. And this is how they trick you because if you belong to Judaism, Christianity, Islam, all of them, there isn't but one God. So therefore, if you got many gods, they're getting away from you as fast as you can without you even trying to understand what they were talking about. You need to understand the principle of war, the principle of air, the principle of fire. You need to understand these principles so that you can use them to your advantage. In ancient Kemet and Kosh, the Kemetrical believed in one creator, the spiritual consciousness of all things. The one creator. So I'm letting you know where they got this information from. Where the Greeks and Romans got this information from. The spiritual consciousness of all things. The one creator, divine principle, principles and laws are called Neturu. And the worship of the Neturu was part of an everyday life. As in civilization, the spiritual system was linked to mythology and spiritual revelations. Much spiritual beliefs were centered around the heavens and the earth, and the Hapi Ichiru. The comedic spiritual practice were linked to celestial movements, constellations, the sun, Ra, the moon, Ea, the planets, which in turn guided their mythologies. So above, so below. You are not separate from the whole. Netcha, you are one with Netcha. In my book, Spiritual Warriors Are Healers, the first chapter, I deal with the Netcha and the Netcha root. And the Netcha root is all. It's the all. So therefore, all of us are part of this one divine energy. If, if you could step outside of it, the Netcha wouldn't be the all, it would be the partial. Okay, but because you cannot step outside, because everything is part of the Netcha. You see? The word God should not be substituted for the word nature. God is a Greek, a Gothic word, dog backwards. It has nothing to do with your culture or concept. And we don't translate the same As I define nature, I say nature is the air that you breathe. The nature is your heartbeat. Nature is the water. Nature is a bug. Now, when you, think, when you say God is a bug, you say, no, God created the bugs, but God ain't a bug. No, the nature is all things. All things are part of the nature. So I want you to see how like, we can make that distinction. There's nothing out, the nature didn't make you and stop. I don't know how y'all could believe the fairy tale. Did somebody work for six days and then they've been on a break ever since? <laughs> or they've been answering phones for people's prayers. No, they, nobody listened to your prayers up there. Everything is right here. You are your consciousness. The nature is here. There's a smallest example of a particle is called a quark. And when they look through an electrical microscope and they can see the quark, guess what? When you look at it, it's there and then it vanishes. And then it's there and it vanishes. And when you look at it and I look at it, it don't vanish at the same time. So it means that the observer yeah. is affecting it. Right. So you are the creator observing itself. Some of y'all get that in the morning. 
Spirituality is not religion. Being spiritual just means you're in touch with your divine self. I heard your brother before me say something really dangerous. This is not to contradict what he's doing. But you don't need education. You don't need all this stuff. All you need is Jesus. No. You have to prepare yourself. We tell people you need to have a degree of mastery of five domains. And the first domain is the mineral domain. The planet is a mineral. The sun is a mineral. The stars are mineral. And you are made up of stardust. You are a carbon-based unit. Mm -hmm. That's what you are. And you are ignorant of the mineral domain. And if we just take the earth mineral, if I take the topography of the earth, you are ignorant of that. The very planet that you, that's housing you. We don't know nothing about topography. We look at the continent we come from. What percentage is, there's only four main terrains. You have rainforest, savanna, grassland, you have Sahil, shrubs, semi-dry, and then you've got desert. Mm. That's it. Most people think that Africa is a jungle. There's more trees in New York than there is percentage of any place in Africa except for the Congo. Mm. Did y'all hear me? But they got you thinking you come from the jungle. There were more trees in Europe than there ever was in Africa. But they got you thinking you came from. And then listen to the terminology. English is really dangerous language. If I say, brother, your breath smells like a tropical rainforest, <laughs> you wouldn't be upset, would you? In fact, if your breath smells like a tropical, you start thinking something real fresh and sweet. Right? But if I said, brother, your breath smells like jungle juice, you'd be like, what? You're ready to fight me. I'm still talking about the same plant. All I did was change the name. So English, my father told me when I was young, he says, the Europeans call this beautiful nature wilderness. Like it's wild. They're the only thing wild out here. <laughs> Everything is in its natural state. And he's talking about the wilderness. And the wilderness needs to be conquered. That's wrong ideology. Wrong concept. And we're now thinking the same way. We didn't try religion, putting our hands up saying, don't shoot, marching, singing. Maybe it's time for us <laughs> to go back to our ancient form of spirituality. So just keep that in the back of your mind. Breathe in gratitude, breathe out love, reflect kindness to all. This is a reflection, this is what your church looks like. Whoever controls the minds of our children controls our future. We've been, we begin to awaken the very moment you realize one fact. You are creating your own reality through the energy of your consciousness. Don't put all your apples in somebody else's face. Don't say no matter what you do, some other entity can save you. The creator sent you to save yourself. There's guides around here that can help guide you when you appear to be lost and you take counsel. But even I'm a doctor of naturopath holistic healing. I can't save nobody. The mm -hmm. only thing I can do is give you some advice and try to create the conditions so that you can save yourself. Mm -hmm. But in the final analysis, who has to do it? You. You. Heal thyself. You are the only person that can heal you. Other people can aid and guide you. But you. Now I'm going to say something else going to sound crazy, but just bear with me. You have the right to be crazy. You do. And that you gave you will. You have the right to kill yourself. Not only that, you have the right to choose your own poison. It's unfortunately in this society, we think that you can eat poison and your enemy is going to die. <laughs> We must teach our children to be unapologetically black Africans. Yeah. Unapologetically is the word that's most profound. The only difference between a Puerto Rican, a Dominican, a Jamaican, a Haitian, a Cuban, and an African in America was a boat stop. We must return to a holistic healing system. Awakening is about letting go. 
Today, be thankful and remember how rich you are. Your family is priceless, your time is gold, and your health is wealth. Now, in ancient Kemet, pay attention to this. There were four cosmologies. That's it. Explain, cosmology explains the origins of things. One was the cosmology of Anu. The other one, the cosmology of Hetkapata. Another one is the cosmology of Kemenu. The other one is the cosmology of Waset. Each one of these cosmologies, one says that the creator spoke things into existence. So there's the power of the word. In the beginning was the what? Word. The word. And the word was? God. And the word was with? God. You are that. You can speak things into it. You have, right. when it says you are natural like God, like, it means that you have the ability to think it, then plan it out, and then bring it into fruition. Mm -hmm. That's what the creator's doing. What we're seeing is the emanation when you look at the universe, the cosmos, the creators of thought. You are an emanation of the creator's thoughts. Now what you do with those thoughts, he's giving you the power to what? Govern it. Mm -hmm. I need you to understand that. Some of us have relinquished our power. And sometimes that's what religion does. They have you relinquish your power and put all your faith in something else. And sometimes something that never existed. Oh, so one was thought. I mean, or speak. The other one was think to think things into existence. The other one was to it masturbate it. That's procreation, to bring things into existence. The other one, he spit forth creation, coming from the inner, your inner heart, your inner moments. Okay, those, so they have to use that. Almost every religion is going to use one of those to talk about uh, how things came into existence. This is an a insect burger from uh, Castile, which is an ancient Nubian, ancient Kush, Sudan today. What I want you to show you here, what's powerful here, this incense burner, now they got 3,800, but it's literally about 4,200, 4,400 BCE. But what's important here is that this existed before ancient Kemet came into existence. So you heard me earlier say that Kemet was the mouthpiece of the African continent. So now, that's just a statement. So now let me speak it into existence and show you. This incense burner was found in Castile, which is in present-day Sudan, before Narva united Upper and Lower Kemet into a nation state. Here is the ruler sitting on his throne, on his square, wearing the white crown. This is 400 years before Kemet comes into existence. There's Haru. Shemsu Haru, the great falcon, on top of the Seret, that's on top of the White House. There's the center pointed star, which is Sirius A, the brightest star in the sky. We are already doing astronomy, which also represents Aset and Sushat. Here's the, uh, the great black lion, which is the foundation for Haru M. Aketi. Haru M. Aketi that you see there, what they call the Sphinx, was an all lion first. It was the black lion. And then they put a priest's head on top of it, which was carved much later. So there it is here. Here are, are boats that travel up and down the Nile. This is, again, three or four years before Kemet came into existence. Here's a facade of stone of, of the building that the, the ruler presides in. So I'm just trying to show you all of these concepts were in existence before Kemet. So Kemet inherited this from the Nubian black brothers from up south. So many times you'll always put, I always put Kemet and Kush together. European Egyptologists try to make believe that the Nubians were the enemies of ancient Kemet. They'll show you uh, Tet Akama with some Nubians underneath his foot. He didn't show you that on the other foot, he had some Asiatics and Europeans underneath him. Mm -hmm. He was saying he was ruling everybody. He wasn't just picking on blacks, but they only showed you the black one underneath the foot. Wow. Archaeological finds such as the custom incident burner affirms the cultural continuity between Kemet and Kosh. Cultural continuity, that's from the south to the north. When we begin to talk about civilization, there are six things we have to talk about. One, a written language. 
Number two, a sophisticated plan architecture structure. Three, plan cities, not just a village. Number four, a functional calendar and organization of time and space. Number five, an organized economy with planned agriculture and animal domestication. And number six, a defense system to protect what you develop. That was done in ancient Kemet, ancient Kush, a thousand years after the last great flood. So the last great flood took place about 10,000 years ago. So 1,000 years after, and let me just say something, the last great flood decimated about 90% of the world's population. Africa was affected the least because the whole African continent is a plateau. The whole continent is above sea level. So if the water rises 500 feet and you're in an island, look, that's all folks, it's over. If you live along the coast, which most people live along the coast, and the water rises 500 feet, it's a wrap. And you ain't got time to pack. <laughs> okay, so tsunami comes, and, and it's over, it's over, it's, it's tidal waves, it's over, earthquake, everything, okay, 90% of the population. So before the Great Flood, Africans did not write down their stuff, they had symbols and stuff, but they didn't write down. After the Great Flood, they realized that since they lost so much, that they need to record, so that when the next catastrophe happened, records would be left. How many people heard the expression, writing is on the wall? It's still on the wall, waiting for you to read it. <laughs> but you got to learn to do it. I hope this clarifies the confusion around civilization. Culture is not necessarily civilization. The first humanoids had culture. So did Homo erectus and Homo habilis. Even cavemen, the Amu, have culture. Modern humans have been around for over 500,000 years or more, originating here in Africa, as in all other stages did. Um, Dia did some fantastic work. He showed that all humanoids can be broken into six categories. There were six phases of the human development. We are the last, Homo sapiens sapiens is the last stage. But for all six are on the African continent. Only two in Europe or Asia or North America. Only two. And that's the last two phases. So you have. Uh, the early stages in Europe would have been Neanderthal and then what they call the Peking Man. Mm -hmm. The ancient Chinese tried to do a survey to show that they belonged to Peking Man and not anybody else, that they were separate. And they took 100,000 samples throughout all of China. All Chinese DNA is led to Africa. Mm -hmm. okay. Europeans are the only one that has Neanderthal. If you take a test and you got Neanderthal, it means probably you got an ancestor that got raped or something of that nature from Europe. Okay. But Europeans are the only ones that have Neanderthal in them. Neanderthal did not survive in Africa. He moved out of Africa and died out on the African continent and survived in Eurasia. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, the Neanderthal is a different being. Neanderthal lived through two ice ages. Imagine temperatures being five times colder than your coldest winter. Neanderthal survived that. But when the European came on the scene, they vanished just like that. They didn't just die off. Neanderthal was killed off. I don't know why there's so much superstition in archaeology about dun, dun, dun. what happened to Neanderthal. We know what happened. Y'all killed him. What happened to the Australians? What happened to the Tasmanians? You don't need no theme music. <laughs> there's a group of people who exterminate. Okay, so Neanderthal got exterminated. That's what really happened. So I'm going to cut that. That's not an hour presentation. That's a one minute thing. <laughs> Europeans came on the scene and killed every Neanderthal they could find, but they had sex with it. Now, they had sex with cattle and horses. They had no problem humping on the Neanderthal. Now, this is a timeline. People, if you teach history, if you're in charge of anybody's education, you need to be teaching with a timeline because you have to put things in spatial perspective. Now, this is basically a 4,000 year timeline, and the Greeks and the Romans haven't come on the chart yet. Did y'all hear what I said? The Greeks and the Romans didn't come on the chart yet. So, 
We built pyramids. We built monuments. We had great civilizations. We had mathematics, science, and even here, Tahaka, this is the fourth golden age. This is approximately 690. Now, Duke, uh, 6, 600, 6, yeah, 690 BCE um, is when the Persians, the Assyrians conquered Egypt, and then the Persians conquered the Assyrians. This is towards the end of the Kemetic rule. And they had to rule for about four or 500 years. And then finally, the Greeks came in and defeated the, the, the Persians. Because the Persian Empire was the biggest during that time. If you go back 500 BCE, the Persian Empire ruled. And the Persians, when they came to your village, they would send a messenger. And it would say, bow to the Persian Empire, or we will leave your city in ashes. You have a choice. We'll come back in 24 hours. And, and we want some booty. Leave us about a million dollars out here and go. <laughs> If you didn't do that, they would come in, they rape the men, the women, the children, the dogs, scorch the city, burn everything down, and kill everybody. So what, the only thing to do that was a couple of times. When they came to your village, you was like, what y'all want? What y'all want? You, know? <laughs> you, know, you got the stuff already waiting. So that's how Persia ruled. And Persia, let me just say this. I, have to, I don't want to lay claim, but the Persian Empire mostly was black. But they had some compassion. If you submit, all you had to do was submit to the will of Persia, pay them taxes quarterly, and they would let you run your own city. You, you the mayor, you can remain the mayor. You just, you know, you got to tighten me up every quarter, right? That's all. And they would let you stay. And then they would say, okay, I need a thousand of your breast warriors, and we're going to annex them into the Persian Empire. But if something happened to y'all, we'll come back and protect y'all. Because now you're under our protection. That's how the Persian Empire kind of operated. So the Persian Empire wasn't one group of people. Like when you had the Greeks, it was basically just Greeks and Macedonians. Okay? The Persian Empire was all types of ethnic groups together. And they kind of had their autonomy, but they all worked for the Persian Empire. Okay? But they kind of had so the Persians were able to stay on top for about five or six hundred years because of that type of philosophy. They let you keep your autonomy as long as you bow down to the Persian king and pay them taxes. So Alexander was able to conquer that. Um, and that brought an end to that era. So again, I want you to see the timeline. When we were building the Step Pyramids, 1600 BCE, that's older than the Albanek, the Albanek heads, that's older, the, that's older than the first Shang Dynasty. The Japanese haven't got to Japan yet. So I'm trying to show you on the timeline you need to be able to. We, uh, in January, we'll have this for sale because we, we, we redid it and brought it up to the bottom of the stand. And I use it in the universities. All right, let me just real quickly talk about this. I took people to the Metropolitan Museum. We walk into the Egyptian wing, and there's a map to the side that says, pre-dynastic, the old kingdom, the ancient kingdom. Every name on the list, first of all, it's upside down. The second of all, not is it upside down. Every name on it is Greek and Arabic. Wow. It's the old period. There was no Greek and no Arabic. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to let you know when you walk into the museum, you're not going to be educated. I'm going to continue the indoctrination that I got you in the third grade. So what I did here, no Cairo, the ancient name is Iwinu. No Giza, the ancient name is Aket and Khufu. No Memphis, is Ineb Het, Het Kapata. No Saqqara, Mednefer. No Abydos, Abdu. No Dendra, he went. No Karnak, he put the set. No Luxar, he put, uh, he put, I mean, Waset, he put Reset. No Valley of the Kings, Nefer, Fer, Em, Nebes. No Esna, Tasana. No Edfu, Baget. No Kahumbo, Nebget, no Aswan, Abu, no Phile, Per in Aset, no Abu Simbel, the Jew M. Hak. We know these names, it's written in the Madu Netcher, but we put some Toby names up there that has nothing to do with the cities and the people. So therefore, you can't even unearth the miracles or unearth the power that that city has to offer. You can't even go into antiquity because you're using a colonized Toby name to even talk about it. Because in each name, like hedge, that, that means the white wall. 
of Pekka Pata, the temple of the spirit of Pata, the creative craftsman. So each name has essence to it. The African Kemetic Prescribe. This is the prototype to prescribes all around the planet Earth. These are brothers from the second golden age on the Minchu Hotel. The Shaolin monk, the Tibetan priest, the Buddhist priest, all of them are imitating what was in ancient China. <clears throat> and I can show you the ancient Kemetic picture 3,000 years before they came into existence so you can see which one came first. All of these principles are divided into celestial, trilestial, and duet. Celestial means heaven. So you have like Ra in the heavens. You have uh, Spadet. You have uh, Ma'at, the heavens of the creations. You have Jehuti, articulate thought, the creator. You have Amen. Now I heard the people in the church said Amen. And they knew that they were praying to a black lecture. I don't know if they would have did that. There's Pata, there's Jehuti. These are celestial. These are responsible for creation. Then you have Trilestral, that's Earth. So then you have Asar. You have Aset, the Great Mother. Here's the Trinity. Asar, Aset, and Baru. That's where the Trinity comes from. In fact, in ancient Kemet, Trinities go back even before Kemet came into existence. You had Kanu, Anuket, Setet. Kanu was the mother. He created people from the black mud of the Earth. You sound familiar, that, that's in the Quran, that's in the Christian Bible, straight from here. So I'm trying to show you the origins. Then you got Ptah, the creative spark of the universe. Every cell with a device gives off a spark of life. That's Ptah, okay? Responsible for all life. Then you have Ra. Ra is not the sun. Ra is the energy that allows lights to emanate from the sun. All right, so we're just trying to get you, you know, an idea. We put things in proper perspective. So all of these concepts, uh, then you have Haru, then you have Enpu, you have Set. These are Trilestral. This on, on Earth. That's Earthbound. Then we have something called the Duat, Duat Nature. These are natural rooms that don't exist on Earth or in Heaven, but they exist in a space in between. I believe so the Christians have something in purgatory. I don't know where that's, that's somewhere in between a waiting place or something. I don't know what that is. But anyhow, the duet. This is where your soul gets judged. So I know in King James, you can have, you could have been a, a rapist, a fortificator, a pedophile for 80 years. And on your dying bed, all you got to say is, I repent and I accept Jesus and you're supposed to go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> now that don't make no sense. You are responsible for your actions. That's what ancient Kemet said. There's a scale here. There's a scale. And the scale says, have you been a righteous person? Is your heart right or upright? This is symbolism. Okay, the feather, an ostrich feather, if you ball it into a knot and let it go, it springs right back. Symmetrically perfect. So that's why they use the feather of the ostrich. Again, the interior of Africa. Okay, the interior of Africa, this feather tree. So if your heart is heavy, that means that you got a whole lot of stuff weighing you down. Okay? And so this guy is making money. He's called Amamet, the devourer. And he devours souls. Now this is all spiritual. So you never saw a foot sticking out of his mouth or nothing. <laughs> okay, because this is all this is the soul, this is the spirit. And it means the soul gets devoured. Amamet lets you out again, and maybe you try again. But you don't get infinite trials. After a while, the creator says, okay, this person's not going to learn. We're just going to use his energy in the universe. How many? How many? Oh, I didn't give you. I don't, I don't know if there's a magical number. Usually, it's seven levels of heaven, seven days, so you might get, you know, seven reincarnations. But watch this, y'all. This is a judgment scene. Everybody's using this. Inpu, the guardian. This is Anubi. This is the deceased person. He's being led to the judgment scales of my eye. Jehuti has recorded your whole life. So here are the judges. And the judge says, have you stolen? And you say, Jehuti, I have not stolen. And he said, how about your grandmother's cookies in the fifth grade? I got a record right here. In fact, here's the picture with the cookie juice all around your face. And you say, okay. 
I did take my grandmother's cookies, but when she had no teeth, I chewed her food. <laughs> I carried her, I carried her when she had no legs. And so then Jehuti would say, okay, that's called reciprocity. That balance is out. I excuse you for the cookies. <laughs> so you keep moving. It doesn't mean you have never done no wrong. It means was there reciprocity for the wrong things that you have done? Okay. If you pass that, all these judges is waiting on you. Now they got Jehuti got the record, so you can't you can't lie to him. Okay. If you pass that test, then Haru brings you to his father. This is why in their books. It says the only way to the kingdom of heaven or to God is through the what? Wow. The son. Oh. Through the son. The only way to my father is through the son. Haru is the son of Hassan. So all of them are getting their stuff right here. This is 6,000 BCE, 4,000 years before JC. 3,000 years before the 16, I'm going to bring some books next week called the 16 Crucified Saviors Before Christ. That's 16 different people that did the same thing Jesus Christ did before him. It's a blueprint that you're getting from ancient Kim. And then I'm going to bring Stone of Legacy here so you can see every Greek philosopher where they went to school in Kemet, where they get the information. So that's continuation of this. Asar is depicted green, but he's called the Great Black. Because we understood the mineral domain, the plant domain, and the human domain. Carbon is to the mineral domain as chlorophyll is to the plant domain as melanin is to the human domain. Mm. That's right. Y'all got that? Oh, yeah. uh, sunlight is reflected into food through the through the chlorophyll. All energy in the mineral domain is converted into another substance. All, watch this here, all minerals on the planet is only in three divisions. So we make this simple. It's either a truth, meaning it comes straight out of volcanic or lava, or it's sediment. That means that once it comes out of the lava, then it settles and Maga makes it connects with something else in the sediment, or it's metamorphic, where two or three elements combine with another element to become a third element. So all minerals are in one of those categories. Then the next thing you have to learn is colorology. Imagine when you were teaching your children that you said, this color is red, and red represents your lower chakra center. It represents passion, fire, energy. So now the kid says, red, passion, fire, energy. So you understand that. Red represents my lower chakra. Kids can handle this. Five-year-olds can handle this. This is green. It's your heart chakra. It's for healing. It penetrates life throughout the whole body, just like chlorophyll in the plant. Yes, green represents my heart. Kids understand that. This is purple, the highest spiritual level. Purple rises your vibration, helps you in the fourth and fifth dimension. Purple is the highest octave that the human eye can see. Little kids, yes, the high priest wears purple. I'm raising my elevation. Give me a purple stone. I'm coloring purple. Do you understand how this? But we're not in, care, in charge of our education. So we say, this is red, memorize that. This is green, memorize that. This is orange, memorize that. And there's no connection to the earth. No connection to the mineral, plant, or any domain. This is just a close-up of Asar, the great father who art in heaven, how be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Right here. This is where they get he I mean hell from. A pep is the enemy of Ra. It shows that at night when the sun goes down, and when your life goes down, there's another world waiting on you. You have to be victorious in that world. And it's based upon how you prepared yourself in the world of light. Did you collect enough wisdom so that you can sustain yourself in the underworld? And so they have the Book of Gates. A song. I'm just going to make this real quick. In the book you hear, Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. How many people heard that stanza before? Where did that come from? Here, ancient Kemet. 
This is the heka. A heka is a shepherd's staff. This is an inkaka. This is the inkaka. This is a, a wheat thrasher, a grain thrasher. So the king, Asar, holds this, and every king in ancient Kemet, whether they were male, rulers, male or female, carried these symbols. Okay? So uh, if I give you a little light, the king is saying, I can guide you, and I can direct you. I can lead you. Then he's saying, I can feed you to the grain and the wheat. Right. But he's also saying, how many familiar with the Chinese new chuck? Mm -hmm. Do you know what the new chuck originally was? A grain thrasher. And the Chinese used it into a weapon. Here, we, that's what we did with this. So not only can I feed you, I can give you a royal spanking. <laughs> okay, so I can protect you. So the ruler is saying, I can feed you, guide you, and protect you. I don't know if Trump is saying that. Here's that symbol, you see it in ancient Asar, here you see it in Akin Aten, here you see it in Hatim, a woman who ruled as the head of all of Kemet, and here you see it at Tut I'm, I'm gonna do, uh, okay, before I'm gonna take a break, we're gonna take a 15 minute break right here, uh, cause I'm gonna go into four golden ages, that's gonna set the tone for next week. So when I talk about the ancient Greeks and Romans, you see exactly where they're getting all their information. So um, we're going to take 15 minutes. Do all. Again, I can say, Santi Sana, thank you very much for y'all staying and listening. I'm going to wrap this up in about half an hour. Now, I kind of gave you a little backdrop, so I want to go into, recall. You see, the Europeans have defined this. They created a character named Anathema and said he was the high priest of the Amid Temple during the time of the Ptolemies. When the Ptolemies, the Greeks, were controlling ancient Egypt, they wanted to understand the African people that they were dominating and ruling over. So, Manetho, they had closed all the temples and brought all the, the doctrines, all the, doc, all the documentation, the books, to one temple, the Temple of Amun. And Manetho was supposed to be the head of this temple. So they told Manetho to go to the archives and write the history of these African people we are controlling here in Kemet. We want to know it from the beginning up to now. And so Manapho broke ancient Kemet up into dynasties. A dynasty is a family rule. So it's not like a decade, 10 years, a millennium, a thousand, or a decade, or a century, a hundred, you know. Uh, a dynasty is a family rule. It could be 28 years, 152 years. It's a family rule or the same ideology. So he broke ancient Kemet up into 31 dynasties. But the people of Kemet didn't know nothing about it. This is after Kemet has fallen. Somebody goes back and rewrites the history and puts them into family groupings. So that's what Egyptologists use. My teachers, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Ben, Asa Hilliard, and Dr. Jason Cutler said, this is crazy. That's not how the ancient Kemet defined themselves. So they broke it into four golden ages. So that's the way I teach it. Four golden ages. The four golden ages is supposed to be the first six dynasties of ancient Kemet. It's the first golden age. Then there was the intermediate period, where there was chaos, drought, government broke down. Then people reunited again, and we start the second golden age. That's the so-called 11th dynasty, so that you follow with me. So if you read their books, 11, 12, and 13 is supposed to be the middle, what they call the middle kingdom. We don't use the word kingdom because then that means that how about the women? Kingdom is a racist, sexist terminology in itself. Yeah. So we say the second golden age. Very good. Okay. The third golden age is what they call the new kingdom. And that's the so-called 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st dynasty. But we call it the third golden age. But and the 17th dynasty, see, is obviously black coming from the south. So they try to put that as part of the intermediate period. Well, really, there's nothing to distinguish it. The ruler of the 18th dynasty is the son of the people in the 17th dynasty, so there's no change in family. But again, politically, they do what they want to do so they can try to separate from the blacks. 
So we have the third golden age. The fourth golden age, they leave out altogether. That's the so-called 25th dynasty. They try to say that that was foreigners. No, that's the Kushites from the south coming home to rule after it's been moved astray by the Libyans and other people. So that's just, it's like your grandchildren coming back to set your house straight. Okay, so that's the fourth golden age. So those are the four golden ages, and then you have foreigners, you have the Assyrians, then you have the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans, then you're gonna have the Turks in 640, the Arabs come in and sack Egypt in 640, and that's the beginning of Islamic history. There's no ancient Arabic history. The Sufi is created in 640. After they sacked the temples in Kemet, they translated everything from Arabic, I mean from Medunetje, um, into Arabic. So that's the beginning of the Greek. There's no Quran when they, after that, all of a sudden there's a Quran. They claim they found some books in a cave. Okay, all right. But all of it's based on ancient Kemet. The Moors, you don't hear anything about the Moors until this time. So the Africans who were converted to Islam become the Moors, who traveled into Spain bringing civilization. Okay. After the Roman Empire fell, and I'm going to go into great detail next week, when the Roman Empire fell around 465, the Vandals from, from Europe just came in and just tore up and wrecked everything. That's why today when you tear stuff up, they say it's what? Vandalism. Right. And they just went berserk on people because the people from Russia then were berserks. And when they just tear people and kill for no reason at all, they say you went berserk. Well, these are names of European countries, nations, and people, the berserks, the Vandals. So we use it today. Symptomatically, I'm trying to connect you with the thoughts. We say the words and we don't connect them to a people. Okay, so I'm trying to make that connection so you understand. So they try to make you like you were tearing stuff up. We created the stuff, they tore it up. So the first golden age, like I said, is the beginning. This guy is Nama. He is the founder of the first golden age. Now, what does he look like to y'all? Does he look of African descent? He comes from the Sudan. Okay, so he is the founder. They'll try to tell you that the only black rulers in ancient Kemet was the 25th dynasty. That's ridiculous, okay? So, he is the founder. He sets up the first golden age. This is the normal power. And he's wearing the white crown. Remember the white crown? Excuse me. Remember the white crown all the way up here before Kemet came into existence. So he is normal. Wearing the white crown, the same white crown that his ancestors three, four hundred years before him. Then he's wearing the red crown as he conquered the people from the north. In the north, during the intermediate period, we have a group of people called the Hyksos. Hyksos simply mean foreign rulers, Asiatics. They were the Asiatics that came in. They didn't be the Syrians and the Persians, but they came in. And people were kind of connected to the Jews, European Jews. They conquered those people, kicked them out of Africa, and reunited up in the lower town. Every ruler shows himself doing this. There's a mace in his hand, beating his enemies, smashing his enemies. Was no turn the other cheek. They didn't say we shall overcome. There was no kumbaya. They came in and they took care of business and united the nation. This is called Polaro Stone. This is a record of all the kings, so we know the names of all the rulers, male and female. This Yusufit is the ruler's name, meaning ruler from the south and a ruler from the north. The north was where the bees, beehives, and the honey was. Wow. Right? Mm -hmm. And then in the south was the soup plant. Mm -hmm. And so that was simple. Okay. When I said the name was Neti, Neti is the two ladies, that's Nekabet and Wajet. Which also represents upper and lower kibble. Yes, sir. Uh, you said the soup plant? The soup. The soup plant. Yeah, S W. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The soup plant was a food. It was used to make rope. It was it was uh, it was used for about ten baskets, everything like that. It was nutritious. So that was symbolic of the South. So that's why. Also, the soup plant was it was considered a symbol of divinity. Because it came from the south in the land of their ancestors, mm -hmm. the interior of Africa. So I'm trying to show you symptomatically where this is coming from. 
So this is why people want to say the family. They don't want to connect you to the interior and the history and the culture of the people. We are the first people to domesticate honey and sell it around the world, import, export. Mm -hmm. And just about every time, they had barges of honey mm -hmm. where they could control the, the bees' diet and they would just have, you know, honey made just from maple. Honey just made from, you know, the blueberries. Honey just from this, right? But well, that's an ancient pepper. So this is the first golden egg. This guy over here is Pepe. Um, it's Pepe 1 and 2. Actually, Pepe Minkara and Pepe Makara. Before the first dynasty, Egypt was, in uh, fact, two lands. According to folk tales, Menes, that's the person I just showed you, also his name is Narma, the first mortal king after the rule of the Netsharu, united these two lands. But at the end of the first dynasty, there appeared to be a survival between the two. So we have the names, Nong, Aha, Dajar, Dajet, Din, Adnaju, Semerket. So we know their names of all the rulers of the so-called first dynasty. When this was taking place, there's no other nation state recorded mm. on the planet Earth. Mm. Wow. Mm. No other nation state recorded on the planet. Hmm. So I just need to just make that clear. If you went throughout Asia, there was no Persia yet. There was no Sumer. Sum Sumer, Sumer is one of the first Asian countries. That's not, because those are the same people, Kush. People will argue that the cuneiform is older or rather the Madhu Neche. But what I want to let you know is both of them were black folks. Wow. Both of them came from Kush. People who created cuneiform and people who created the Madhu Neche. So I just want you, it's like Twiggly B, Twiggly W. But the Madhu Neche is a little old, okay? And the cuneiform is only abstract. The Madhu Neche is the language of nature. So remember I said you need to know about the mineral domain, the plant domain, the animal domain, then the human domain, then the spirit domain. Yeah. And we are ignorant, I told you how ignorant we are of the mineral domain. We don't understand the plant domain. We understand that that's the food that lives off of the minerals. And then the animal domain. Animals were not put here for us to eat. And they were here before we were. All the animals were here before humans. You need to understand that. They're not supposed to be our pets. They're not supposed to be enslaved by us. You don't want nobody carrying you around on the leash. Okay, so. And when you create the extension of an animal, you offset the ecosystem of the planet. Wow. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. When you make an animal extinct, no more, they had a function in a particular territory, in a land. So when you erase that, you offset the ecosystem. Yes. Wow. When you cut down the rainforest, you decimate millions of animals, creating them extinct. So you're changing the whole atmosphere of the planet. In ancient Kevin, if you cut down the tree, you make the plant fire. Mm. Because maybe two might not exist. Might that make it? Okay, so it was important. You need to be one with your environment. That was important. Uh, the second, the so-called, uh, that was in the first dynasty. At the end of the second dynasty, we had a rivalry between the Haru, the Rishemsu Haru, the followers of Haru, the great falcon, and the followers of Set. Mm. So there was a battle. So the first rulers were Haru. Then it was a battle, and Set took over. These guys got Set at the end of their name. Set at the end of their name. Kasa Kimbi at the end wasn't taking any chances. He put Haru and Set on his crown. <laughs> <laughs> These are the people, and I need you to see the people. See, this is why this is so important. That's the founder of the so-called Third Dynasty. Look at that brother. He looks like the guy in KRS-4. Yeah. Doesn't he look just like yeah. that? Yeah. 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 He looks just like that, right? Look at this brother. And he's got big jumbo locks.